This is Duke University. Uh, good evening, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today uh, as part of this conference, Rethinking Global Cities. Uh, although I write extensively about globalization and its connection to culture and urbanism, I'm not at all a fan of the global city discourse. Uh, I feel that the discourse, uh, indeed vibrant at the turn of the new millennium, may have uh, outlived its utility. When uh, Erdag and Maryam invited me to speak to you several months ago, um, I was on sabbatical, as I still am, it's my first sabbatical in 10 years, at that time in Hong Kong, mainly working also on another book uh, in which South Asian examples or case studies uh, were essential. Um, I was going to present to you today my research on how globalization may have impacted the traditional settlements of the Global South, uh, particularly those of the Middle East and South Asia, but the events in Hong Kong at that time made me rethink my talk and possibly even my entire notion of the global. You see, Hong Kong at the time, um, a city that many actually consider a global city, uh, was going through its own uprising, mainly against the real or a perceived hegemony of Beijing, and the threat that further integration with the mainland, with mainland China, would result in the loss of relative freedoms that its citizens enjoy. It was, in a sense, a discourse about citizenship in city-states or in special economic zones in this new age of globalization. <clears throat> Having witnessed some of the first protests and the reaction of the police to them, I could not help but be excited about the emergence of a new social movement, symbolized by what some of my students that I got exposed to at Hong Kong University uh, called the Yellow Umbrella Movement. I tweeted that day that Occupy Central, which is the space that the students camped in for a good uh, 60 days, uh, and the name that was actually given to the movement, Occupy Central, so I tweeted, Occupy Central is the new Tahrir Square. To my surprise, it was picked up by so many people so quickly. So I decided that I will speak to you today instead about urban space, about media, about politics, and about their contribution to the globalization discourse. When the so-called Arab Spring started almost four years ago now, earlier in Tahrir Square, and of course before that in Tunisia, Tahrir Square became a household name around the globe. When media outlets like CNN and Bloomberg and BBC approached the usual talking heads, they had very little to say, in fact, about urban space. Uh, all they could talk about is basically the politics of US-Egyptian relations. Architectural urban historians like myself suddenly became useful to these cable channels. Uh, to my surprise, I made one appearance uh, in uh, CNN, which resulted in seven appearances the next day in all of the other channels. Mind you, that never happens to an architectural historian, but it just happened to me. My talk today will build on this engagement and will try to present to you the spatial and temporal dimensions of these urban revolts uh, with a particular attention to the interwoven relationship between social media that organize the political gatherings the practices of protest in these urban spaces, and the global as well as national media coverage of these events. To do so, of course, I will have to set this more in the larger context, uh, historical and cultural, of the Middle East and the Arab world. I am an urban historian, after all, and my stock in trade is the study of cities and spaces. So I will interrogate the spaces of these uprisings with a focus on Tahrir Square in Cairo, which has come to symbolize what some have actually called the spaces of liberation. In your description of the Rethinking Global Cities project, you ask a number of interesting questions. Like, what factors determine the cultural economy of cities as they become global nodes in transnational networks? How do events brand the city as global, and what describes the human experiences of it? What role do imperial legacies play in shaping the dynamics of globalization? Now, I cannot promise that I will answer any of these questions at all, but I will at least give you some things to think about in relationship to them. Let me start with a little anecdote. If you do not know, the word tahrir in Arabic means liberation. My book, Cairo, Histories of a City, that Miriam talked about, 
was released by Harvard University Press in 2011, in January. Of course, as you know, a book takes about a year or so to actually be in press. Um, so it was submitted at the end of 2009. In it, I made the case that Tahrir Square is a space that has not earned its name. I asked, Tahrir from what? Liberation from what? Then the uprising happened. And my editor at Harvard completely freaked out. She contacted me right away and asked me to write a postscript to elaborate on the history of the square. I did. Um, I didn't take back what I said because what I said actually applied at the time that I submitted the manuscript. They put it on their press homepage for several weeks. The New York Times picked it up and published it as an op-ed, as a full-page op-ed piece uh, during the events that were still going on at Tahrir Square. Needless to say, the impact on the sales of my book, written mainly for an academic audience, was completely astounding. Uh, I don't think I'll ever write a book that will sell as much. But to tell the story of Tahrir Square and fully understand it as an architectural space or an urban space, it is necessary to go back to the events that started the uprisings altogether. Let me elaborate here. Perhaps no one could have ever anticipated that these uprisings, particularly in the Arab world, which began when a common street vendor decided to emulate himself in a small town in Tunisia to protest what he felt was bad treatment, if you will, uh, by the authorities. Of course, this very specific incident resulted in the Tunisian uprising and ultimately the overthrow of President Ben Ali in Tunisia. Uh, Egypt at that time, uh, I would argue, was totally unaware of what was going on in Tunisia. However, uh, many Egyptians, um, possibly feeling, if you will, uh, how can a small nation like Tunisia, uh, whose entire population fits in one district in Cairo, be able to overthrow their dictator, and Egyptians can't. So, to protest the brutality of their own police, uh, Egyptians decided to engage in a demonstration in, in fact, a day that the government had declared long ago as a national holiday and called it Police Day. To ground the uprising which spread from square to square in Cairo and from city to city in Egypt, I think it is necessary to deconstruct the symbolic significance of these spaces where the uprisings have unfolded and to map out the chronology and the geography of the protests. Inherent in each of these spaces is a particular architectural history and a social geography that allows us to better understand the city and the events that occurred in it. The emergence of Tahrir Square as a focal point for the revolt is a testament to how place and history come together in unexpected ways. Images of the square were, I'm sure, as you know, extensively aired during the broadcast coverage of these uprisings and have forever been ingrained in the minds of people all over the world. These images capture a number of buildings uh, that not only narrate the history of modern Cairo, but also offer us insights into the contradictions of modern Egyptian history as it encountered colonialism, modernism, pan-Arabism, socialism, and today, neoliberalism. I will try to do so by invoking three important figures from Egyptian history who played a major role in the making of the square itself. Hence, they become the three main characters in our story. Khedev Ismail in the mid-19th century, whom you see on your left. Um, king Farouk, who was in fact the last presiding king over Egypt as a kingdom. And Gamal Abdel Nasser, who turned Egypt into a republic 60 years ago. Tahrir Square is not really a single square. It is actually three different uh, connected spaces forming a major traffic hub. The buildings that formed the square were indeed more expressive of Egypt's contemporary secular history and not the religious imaginary of the Islamists who ultimately took over the protests and then the country altogether between July 2012 to July 2013. I want to point to these buildings very specifically because I'll return to some of them. In fact, you start here with the Egyptian Museum. There are a number of commercial buildings, some of which were also residential back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, 
Then you get to a major government building called the Mugamma, which I'll talk about its history. Uh, this actually continues, and you have the Hilton Hotel, the headquarters of the National, Democrat, the National Democratic Party, which in fact used to be Mubarak's party, and then ending with the Egyptian Museum again. Um, this is actually an image of this particular square from the 1960s, a much more innocent time, and you can actually see many of those same buildings. Uh, this is the museum. You don't see the Mugamma here. This is the Arab League. Uh, way back in the Gazir Island is the Cairo Tower, the Hilton Hotel, the National Democratic Party. In the middle, in fact, there is this pedestal, again, for this very specific image from the 1960s, uh, which I will also elaborate on. Khdevi Ismail, the founder of modern Egypt, embarked on the project of modernizing Cairo, a la Paris of Haussmann. He had actually spent quite a lot of time in Paris, and that was a very important component of his plans for Cairo. He imagined Egypt as part of Europe and not necessarily as part of the Middle East. Um, the initial plan of this very specific area made, uh, if you will, uh, the, the square. It was laid out as part of a district called Ismailia after the name of Ismail himself. It was then that the square that we now call Tahrir was laid out as a public space. The square actually witnessed its first important building, the Egyptian Museum or the Museum of Egyptian Antiquity, built in 1901, which is the building that you actually see here. Uh, and I'm starting here from the north of the square. Ismail's modernization project and partial corruption plunged, however, the country into great debt. He was the first ruler of modern Egypt to be removed from power, not by his people, like Mubarak was, but in fact, by foreign bankers who had lent him money to build the Suez Canal and then convinced their nations to intervene uh, on their behalf. What followed was the British occupation or colonization of Egypt uh, in 1882, which actually lasted for almost 70 years. In Cairo, the British stationed their troops in the Ismailia district, uh, close to what now became the square, if you will, in the same place where Napoleon, ironically, had also stationed his troops in 1799 when he occupied Egypt. During the early part of the 20th century, the Ismailia district became downtown Cairo, and it expanded towards the square which underwent replanning to facilitate the newly introduced vehicular traffic. The roundabout that you actually see here, and unfortunately the light is really uh, very strongly focused on the image, so uh, I think you can barely see it. Uh, in the middle, in fact, uh, was this pedestal that I showed you earlier. This was, in fact, a pedestal that was commissioned by King Farouk um, uh, to, uh, to accommodate uh, a sculptor, a sculpture uh, of his grandfather, Khedev Ismail, um, he had commissioned an Italian sculptor to uh, sculpt this statue. Tahrir Square was very much taking shape during this period of the 1940s and 1950s. The square, however, witnessed its first political demonstration during the same era. Opposition to British occupation in Egypt sparked protests and skirmishes with police resulting in the death of two dozen Egyptians on February 11th, 1946. February 11th, uh, 2011 is a very significant day for Egyptians today because it is the day in which Mubarak was forced to resign. Dissatisfaction with King Farouk's government way back then brought about another set of protests that ignited the Great Cairo fire, which I'm actually showing parts of it for you here. Ironically, again, on another significant day, January the 25th, 1952. And that's where history comes in. And you know, of course, many of these are little tidbits that most people don't really care about, but historians do. A few buildings in the square were casualties of the blaze. Almost on the same day, 59 years later, the Egyptian people descended upon Tahrir Square in unprecedented numbers to protest Mubarak's government. An accident of history, perhaps. But Tahrir Square scored its first significance. This is actually an image of the square, not from 2011, when tanks came into the square, but rather from 1952. The fire was a precursor for an army coup led by the young and charismatic Gamal Abdel Nasser, 
which transformed Egypt from a sleepy kingdom into a revolutionary socialist republic. In the following decade, Nasser issued a governmental decree changing the name of the square from Ismailia, the idea was to totally obliterate any memory of Egypt as a kingdom, to Tahrir Square, and that was to commemorate the departure of the British from Egypt. Tahrir Square was thus given its current name. In the late 1950s, the Mugamma was built. This was a curved government complex overlooking the square with a bulky Soviet-like appearance located in the southern edge of the square. It has long been a symbol of the monumental Egyptian bureaucracy for the past six or seven decades. No wonder uh, that it was actually designed by an architect who studied in Russia and was in fact built with the support of the former Soviet Union. It stands architecturally as a witness to Egypt's socialist history. No Kyrian could have ever avoided a trip to this building uh, in their lifetime. I had to go to it many, many times, even though I have always been an American citizen, but to maintain my Egyptian nationality, I had to go there many times. As the government units uh, that are housed in it cover everything. They are issue birth certificates, passports, taxes, whatever you want. East of the square, is another important building, the Arab League. It is again an organization, sort of the United Nations of the Arab world, designed in this case by an Egyptian architect in an Arab Islamic style. It was built a bit earlier in that decade, same decade, early 1950s, during a time of rising Arab nationalism. Next to it was the Hilton Hotel. It's still there, but it's no longer called the Hilton Hotel. It was built in 1961, ironically at the time or at the height of Egypt's socialist drive, on the site of the former English barracks, and was a major achievement that Nasser celebrated when he opened it because he saw it as Egypt's official entry into the international tourism industry. For that to happen, it had to be designed by a famous American architect, and it had to look like other Hilton hotels around the world, despite Nasser's socialist orientation. In fact, they issued several stamps commemorating it, as you can actually see from both of these stamps. It was something that Egyptians took quite a lot of pride in. It long served as the place that housed visiting Western dignitaries, politicians, journalists, and entertainment figures, and where major regional and international deals were made. A James Bond movie was actually filmed there as well. The hotel was under renovation to become the Ritz-Carlton when the Tahrir events brought all development projects in Cairo to a standstill, even until today. Next to that is another building, an important building. Uh, this was the modernist building that was designed initially to serve as Cairo municipality. It was first appropriated by the Nasser regime in the early 60s to serve as the headquarters of his Arab Socialist Union, the single party or the Politburo that governed Egypt as a police state for much of his rule. Mubarak's National Democratic Party would later replace the Arab Socialist Union and the building simply took, over, uh, took it over uh, to serve its new masters. The building today now stands totally burned um, since the uprising. For four years it stood like that, almost as a symbol of the paralysis of the Egyptian political sphere. All buildings in the square uh, play the role in the making of modern Egypt, as I attempted to show. They allow us a better understanding of how Egyptians relate to this public space. Many of them were, no doubt, aware of that history. In a twist of irony, the pedestal that I talked about, uh, in which you know King Farouk had ordered the statue of his grandfather, Khadiv Ismail, uh, the statue actually arrived in Egypt um, on July 30th, 1952, one week after the uh, 1952 coup or revolution. Uh, it was never placed, of course, on the pedestal. And today it is stored somewhere in a small park. Very few people see it. The symbolism of the empty pedestal, a remnant of Egypt's failed monarchy, was a, an extremely important landmark that Nasser wanted to leave there. So for people who actually witnessed Egypt in the 60s, 
this was always there as a reminder of this particular time. The pedestal was ultimately removed, in fact, uh, during the construction uh, of the Cairo Metro um, because its foundation stood in the way. Ironically, the square itself uh, also changed name, but for a little while, because after the assassination of Anwar Sadat, it was called Anwar Sadat Square, but nobody remembers it as such. Only the metro station today is called Sadat Metro Station. I think to understand what happened in the square in the 18 days that resulted in the removal of Mubarak from power, it is necessary to look at the role that social media played in it. The actual events themselves have been the subject of extensive media coverage, and I will only get into the spatial aspect of that. The first part for the Egyptian uprising, and notice I resist calling it a, rev a revolution. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, on January the 25th, was in fact, uh, 2011, was a popular Facebook page launched by an Egyptian activist who worked for Google uh, and which had almost over 200,000 followers in early 2011. The page was dedicated to and named after the 27-year-old man, Khaled Saeed, who was beaten to death by the police for supposedly resisting arrest while he was at a cyber cafe in Alexandria a year earlier. The Facebook page offered Egyptians an interactive platform for documenting human rights violations, particularly police violations, making anti-government claims, and mobilizing support. As the sub subscribers to the page grew in numbers and interacted with other oppositional groups online, the Facebook page became an organizational hub for the uprising. Uh, in addition to the main uh, uh, online hub, which was the Khaled Said page, there was also Twitter, where activists used the hashtag January 25th to invite others to join in the conversation as well as to organize themselves. On Twitter, many activists discussed and planned the day. In fact, many of these tweeters, as they are called, discussed uh, and considered themselves citizen, citizen journalists and made it their mission to get out the world, to get out the word uh, to everybody, to the rest of the world, if you will. By broadcasting their political claims, the activists were not only take, talking to their fellow citizens, but to the international community and to the rest of the world. As the tweeterers navigated between virtual and physical space, continual updates from the protesters sustained the activities in the square and hence the demonstrations themselves. To return to our story and particularly to the role that space played in the revolt, once it started on January the 25th, the success of a few protesters to stay in the square for the first two days emboldened the organizers to call for what they called a million man march on January the 28th, a day that was dubbed the Day of Rage. On that day, um, Qasr Neil Bridge, the bridge that connects Giza to Cairo um, and leads directly to Harrier Square, was completely mobbed by thousands of people who wanted to participate in the protest. But the security forces actually met them, and you can actually see these were some of the most powerful images where you have a few people here who were protesting, the police in front of them, refusing to allow them to go. They decided to pray. So here you actually have a group of people praying and the police is using water cannons uh, to defuse the protest. All of the attempts actually by the police failed. In fact, uh, the, the uh, YouTube images of the Qasr Nil incident, as it's called, are very powerful because the protesters managed to take one of the armored vehicles of the police and throw it into the Nile, breaking one of the sides of the bridge with, with their hands. Ironically, of course, protest everywhere also started. So in another square, uh, protest by Mubarak supporters started. Uh, people calling themselves the sons of Mubarak, hundreds of them uh, gathered in a square called Mustafa Mahmoud Square um, and decided to attack the protesters in Tahrir Square, resulting in what is known as the Battle of the Camel. Uh, and that's why you have camels here. It's called the Battle of the Camels because they actually had camels with them uh, when they attempted to take control of this particular space. Mapping out the movement of protesters using different media and ethnographic accounts was actually a project that I engaged with with one of my colleagues in the United Kingdom, 
um, and I don't have uh, a lot of time to talk about it in detail, suffice it to say that the proximity of different Cairo neighborhoods that house different economic classes um, and its accessibility to different transportation forms and its spatial capacity, we're talking about 170 acres, um, have all contributed to the role or to the success of that space becoming a space of revolt. By the 28th of January 2011, the square was now a living camp, a settlement. The protesters had organized themselves into groups and units in charge of its safety, security, food, health, education, and anything you can imagine. And the streets were now surrounded by the military, uh, which were surrounded by the military, started to open up again. On February 10th, and after 70, 17 days of camping, the protesters witnessed one of the most dramatic days of the uprising as they all awaited a speech by Mubarak in which he was expected to announce his resignation or that he was stepping down, but alas, he did not do so, and the protesters in Tahrir took off their shoes, waved it to the television cameras in a gesture uh, reserved for those held in utter disgust. Finally, it was after 18 days of mass protest, um, on February the 11th, it took only 30 seconds for the newly appointed vice president of Egypt, who had only served for five days, to announce that President Mubarak had handed over all of his responsibilities to SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, ending supposedly 60 years of autocratic rule. The regime ultimately fell. Um, after that, Tahrir turned into the biggest party that Cairo had ever witnessed and the celebrations were captured again online exactly in the same manner that the demonstrations and call for demonstrations were also being uh, articulated online. Tahrir Square had finally earned its name. When the celebration finally ended and it was all over, Cairo again witnessed the scene that is so unusual. An army of volunteers descended upon the square armed with house brooms and garbage bags and they went down from house to house, from corner to corner, to clean the debris from the 18 days of the protest and the urban battles. So how was a public space used to help the uprising succeed? A series of quick images to show that, and I will actually, again, not comment very much uh, on them. First, there was the idea of gaining access and claiming the space. Then there was devising spatial strategies for security. Then there was also devising strategies for self-defense. Then there was the notion of how do you protect yourself from people that you do not know. Organizing makeshift medical facilities was extremely important. Many doctors went and volunteered and stayed in the square for seven and eight days, sleeping in tents. This, this uh, experience of what actually happened in the square today is of course of concern for many ethnographers who are doing oral histories to be able to reconstruct what happened because mind you, this is one of the first um, instances, I would argue, in modern Egyptian history where you had people of all classes come together and stay together for such a long period of time. Um, organizing um, you know, makeshift camps, housing camps, creating a space for prayer, creating a venue for the production and the display of media, allowing people to, to read the papers. Um, during the momentous events um, of the uprising, diverse media and communication networks played also a major role in facilitating and broadcasting the uprising to the rest of the world. Traditional media like television, cable news, uh, websites, social media outlets represented by Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and other means of basic communication like cell phones, landlines, all played an important role, an altering role, if you will. As of today, there has been really few in-depth uh, analysis exploring the cyclical, and I would argue, uh, uh, reciprocal relationship between social media, traditional media, and urban space in which the uprising came into being. To understand these uprisings, it is necessary to analyze the ways in which insurgent networks are formed both in social media and in cities, as well as the role of the media coverage of the ensuing events. Of course, the uprisings in the Middle East 
may lead one to suggest that social movements have gone through a distinctive change, that they now involve a whole new repertoire which came into being and is radically challenging the ways of uh, contentious performances as recently articulated by the distinguished political sociologist Charles Tilly. The events of 2011 have both altered and added new types of social movements that went beyond demonstrations or visuals or public rallies. This new multifaceted system is best observed through the messages of social media, the subsequent action in urban space, and its coverage by international and national media. This is a case where the mutually constitutive relationship between these three components unfold. And this is why spatial analysis by um, the eye of an architect or a planner often reveals quite a lot more of the story. Now let me move to um, the second part or the latter part of my lecture and talk about Tahrir squares elsewhere. Inherent in each of these spaces is a particular architectural history that allows us to better understand the events that occurred in it. For example, the revolution that toppled Tunisia's dictator Ben Ali did not happen in the old Medina, which was in fact the hub of political and religious activism in Tunis. Instead, it took place along Burkiba Avenue, a grand boulevard that extended uh, from the old city out to the new city built during French colonialism times. Its space was occupied by thousands of protesters who, as organizers, gave speeches from the windows of the silky white buildings built in the French colonial era. In Sana'a, in Yemen, the demonstrations also started in a square called Tahrir Square, which, which also has a very specific history. It was, in fact, designed uh, and, and, and uh, re redone uh, at a time when Yemen, Yemen civil war was going on. Uh, Egypt's involvement in the Yemen war in the 1960s on the side of the Republicans resulted in the establishment of Yemen as a republic, and hence the Yemenis decided to call their square Tahrir Square as well. While each of the protest movements should be analyzed primarily according to its local and national specificities, the ripple effects that tied the countries of the Arab Spring, in quote, together, and the importance of social media in, enab in enabling it cannot be dismissed. In fact, once it started, the success of the protests across each country emboldened organizers to call for marches elsewhere. In Egypt, this took the form of the Million Man March. The extensive coverage by the international media, which later inspired uh, similar demonstrations around the world uh, in what became known as the Occupy Movement, from Wall Street, uh, you know, in the United States to many other parts of Europe, even to the whole idea of occupy everything. In the academy, a diverse body of work has emerged attempting to explain the spread of these occupy everything uprisings and their failures and minimal successes. Interpreting the social circumstances of the uprisings requires us to engage with the so socio-political theories of authoritarianism, secularism, and fundamentalism on the one hand, and theories of space on the other. At many rallies, as this one in fact in Beirut, Lebanon um, in 2012, protesters could be seen holding small smartphones in one hand and anti-state banners in the other. And from the tents in occupied squares, internet users disseminated images and messages of the protest through social media, later broadcast through regular media as the protests expanded claims made by social media and enacted in physical space in one city could generate a model of protest to be re-enacted in another city, so on and so forth. This cycle also allowed for the emergence of collective enactments that expanded the ever larger number of people culminating in the uh, you know, protests in places like Turkey, in Gezi Park, and in Brazil uh, around the World Cup. Uh, not too long ago, almost last summer. Indeed, by providing space for the enactment of protests, cities from Alexandria to Sana'a, from Cairo to Tripoli, played a decisive role in these global uprisings. Simply put, neither the governments of these nations, nor the traditional mainstream media, nor the rest of the world 
would have paid any attention to the protesters had they not forcefully taken over these symbolically charged public spaces and stayed in them. So this is important to recognize. It is not only about the power of social media to bring people together, it is about the actual physical occupation of these places. As the repertoire of protest was dramatically and immediately transmitted from one country to another, the urban tactics and the practices used in the demonstrations were at the same time being vividly transnationalized across the Arab world. In the end, the use of social media led to the direct political involvement of ordinary apolitical citizens in countries where such involvement had rarely existed. I would argue that this is the most important outcome of all of these demonstrations, despite the fact that very little political change seemed to have occurred as of now. One of the most important outcomes of the uprising has not only been the deconstruction of the old media regime, but also the emergence of this new form of mass movement in urban space. Now to end this without reflecting on the more recent developments that occurred in the spaces of Cairo last summer, which resulted in the toppling of Mohamed Morsi, the legitimately elected by, but ideologically Islamist president uh, of Egypt, uh, would not do us justice. Many Egyptians from all income groups were very unhappy with how their elected president tried very quickly to change the nature of their country, making it more Islamic. So, with, th with some prodding from the military, they went out on the streets again, in this case on June 30th of 2013, to protest the hegemonic rule of his party, the Muslim Brotherhood, and to recall him. Again, this is a very interesting story because recalling a president does not exist in the Egyptian constitution and did not specifically exist in the Egyptian constitution that was written under Morsi in 2012, despite the fact that there was a popular call for it. Uh, but Morsi, um, and it was in fact drafted, but, but Morsi vetoed it in the last minute, uh, and hence there was no way to create a, an administrative political process to recall him. In any case, it was at that moment that the Harir Square lost its importance, and it was replaced by another square in Cairo that had specific connection um, to the institutions of government under Morsi. A good example of this is, in fact, a street, uh, which is a very wide street, almost like a square, called Tahadeya, uh, which existed outside of the presidential palace from which Morsi ruled and which became the site of the anti-Morsi protests. There was another space also as well, a space that has now become uh, infamous, uh, the Rabah Square, Rabah Ladawaya Square, in a Cairo suburb, where a few Muslim Brotherhood preachers had delivered Friday sermons for many years, um, and uh, many of these uh, sermons particularly were considered uh, to be extremely um, on the fundamentalist side. So that space, Rabah, Rabah Square, became the space in which uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters decided to uh, protest. Diffusing these protests was not only done um, in an unpeaceful manner, in fact, it was extremely violent. Many protesters died uh, in the police crackdown on their camps. What I consider to be the most significant contribution, however, of these uprisings are two outcomes. First is the emergence of new forms of political participation. And the second, and more important for us, um, at least for me, as someone who does space, is the return of the public square to political life, to the political arena. On the first, regarding political participation, I would suggest that what happened is the emergence of a new form of street democracy, or direct democracy, that poses a challenge to representative and electoral democracy almost all over the world. For Egyptians, it was a simple choice particularly with Morsi. Why wait three more years to elect someone else who has already proven, if you will, the current, the, the sitting president, many argued, who has already proven totally inept? Why not remove him now, the argument went. Now this has grave implications. Why? Because it completely unsettles how political parties act, it completely disturbs the relationship between state and citizen, and it delegitimizes many of the institutions of the state. 
Yet, it is also a phenomenon that we cannot ignore. On the second outcome, the return of the public square, I would suggest that what happened in these uprisings has pushed the relationship between the old media, the new social media, and urban space to a new height. But these were real uprisings, not Facebook revolutions, as some have dubbed them. I think it would be a great mistake uh, to think that they were Facebook revolutions. They were urban uprisings with all of the messiness, the violence, the unpredictability that accompanies such revolutionary engagements. In 2009, Manuel Castells, the distinguished sociologist who is a theorist of both social movements and communication technology, suggested in his book, Communication Power, that networks of individuals become insurgent communities and that the social explosion of resistance do not need leaders and strategists as anyone can reach everybody to share their rage, end quote. While it may be true that these movements were leaderless, and indeed they were, it is also true that such movements are often appropriated or hijacked by pre-existing and well-organized social and political groups that have acquired credibility through grassroots engagements at the urban level um, for many years, like absolutely what happened with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. It has been providing services that the government or the state was unable to provide. These new spatial arrangements articulated in the cities of the uprisings have brought back the urban question, as Castells envisioned it some 30 years ago, underscoring the need to study the new urban qualities that influence the grievances of insurgent citizens. We need to look at this new urban dynamic that results from social media's impact on urban space. One of the most important outcomes of these movements has been the return of politics to the public sphere and the return of the square as the place for it. Here I have to mention what I consider to be an important precedent for some more than 20 years ago, and that was Tiananmen Square. The geographer and media theorist Mackenzie Wark argued in his appropriately titled book, Virtual Geography, published 20 years ago, that the media coverage of certain events often define the events themselves and brings them into being. Using examples from the fall of the Berlin Wall and the protests in Tiananmen Square in Beijing in the early 90s, he suggested that the media coverage of these urban events beam to the world through then a totally new medium of 24-hour cable networks like CNN drove the events themselves and possibly determined their fate. The events of Tahrir Square occurring 25 years later, but this time using the new social media, seems to have done exactly the same thing, pushing the relationship between media and urban space to a new significance. In the end, revolutions do not happen in cyberspace, even if they get their start there. And what the Cairo experience has shown is that the real messy Tahrir Square, with all of the sweat and blood that spilled into it, and its unpredictable, disorganized, and ever-changing virtual counterpart are two sides of the same coin. This is the future staring us in the face in the age of globalization. Thank you.